Wigan, built from the wealth of over a thousand coal mines, once home to the famous Wigan Casino. Yet what will I find today as I explore not only dying retail, but the great industry of coal which built this country? Come along as I ask, what's left of Wigan? Today I am off to Wigan. I'm going to retrace the steps of George Orwell who went to Wigan in 1936 and it led him on to write The Road to Wigan Pier which was him investigating unemployment and the mining industries of the northern towns. Now I've just finished the book The Road to Wigan Pier so on today's journey it will be accompanied by the words of George Orwell at times so I think this is going to be really interesting because I'm going to explore the high street, but I'm going to look further into what Orwell was talking about, the mining communities, all those industries, the cotton industry was massive as well. So today as well, we're going to look at my family history of mining, as that's something that I've never really investigated. I've thought about it and looked briefly at it, but never properly explored my ancestors, who were these miners. So this is going to be really, really interesting today, I'm sure. So let's do it. Let's get to Wigan. Let's contrast what he found in 1936. What will I find today in 2023? It's going to be really good. For quite a long time, the train were rolling through open country before the villa civilization began to close in upon us again and then the outer slums, and then the slag heaps, belching chimneys, blast furnaces, canals and gas meters of another industrial town. And look at this, straight out of the station. One there, empty. Another one here shop to let and look at this down here that's got to be an old pub hasn't it or something that so immediately presented with some boarded up stuff and what's this here bloody hell So you present with all that, just as you come out of the station, that's all right there. Post office here, boarded up. So the road to Wigan Pier. It really is a good book. There's no one better than Orwell at writing that essay style autobiographical novel. Unlike homage to Catalonia when he went and fought in the Spanish Civil War, he was accepted by the locals there in the fight against Franco or in Down and Out in Paris and London, when he becomes homeless and hangs out on the streets. And it is so clear in those two books how much he did manage to penetrate those societies. But there was one sect of society that Orwell couldn't fully penetrate, and that was the working class, the northern working class in particular, with his posh accent and his Etonian background. He couldn't fully blend in and give a true viewpoint of what it's like to be working class. And he admits that in the book later on. For months I lived entirely in coal miners' houses. I ate my meals with the family, I washed at the kitchen sink, I shared bedrooms with miners, drank beer with them, played darts with them. But though I was among them, and I hope and trust they did not find me a nuisance, I was not one of them, and they knew it even better than I did. But that in no way takes away from it being a great account of what it was like at those times in Wigan and other surrounding northern areas as well, when cotton and coal were king. So I've just got to this main pedestrianised bit here and there's one to let here and then just down there there's two down there as well that are shut but so far in this area it looks good it's well busy honestly so yeah I just scanned the QR code there and yeah it's part of the levelling up so we'll see how much of it comes to fruition but yeah they're saying it's about 135 million pound overall for loads of different areas to be fair empty one there honestly very pleasantly surprised walking through here there's only one oh no one two two units really that are empty in here that's great, oh no, three, and another one there, four, okay, maybe I spoke too soon, 
but um, five. Look, it, at the top half's really good. The bottom half, not so much. But check out this. What the hell? Normally, when I uh, read leveling up, I look over the fence and now it's going on. But you can hear that something's actually going on there. So that's good. Trade since the war had to adjust itself. For the price of one square meal, you can get two pounds of cheap sweets. You can't get much meat for threepence, but you can get a lot of fish and chips. Milk costs threepence a pint, and even mild beer costs fourpence. And above all, there is gambling, the cheapest of luxuries. Even those on the verge of starvation can buy a few days hope. So yeah, that area where I've just been with the fences all around it, it is massive. The amount of work they're doing there is crazy. It's a huge, huge space. And there is a lot of shops around it boarded up, but I don't really know what they're turning that into. If you know, let me know. I guess it's part of that 135 million pounds I said, but we'll have to come back and check on that at some point in the future. See what's happened there. We've got this Casa Carlos. So the people that George Orwell was lodging with in Wigan, they owned a shop as well, and he says this, I just like this quote, it says, I doubt whether any of their businesses had ever paid. They were the kind of people who run a business chiefly in order to have something to grumble about. Look at the architecture of this though, I think this is the town hall. Just opposite the town hall. Yeah, I've got one there to let. But yeah, wow, look at this. Look what we've got here. And what does it say here? It says, in memory and gratitude of Wigan and district miners, the men, women and children who served and helped to build our community, their hardship and dedication must never be forgotten. So here's a good place. Wow, he looks like he's looking right in your eye, doesn't he, that guy? So here, I think so an appropriate spot to talk about the history of Wigan. So, mining in Wigan dates back to around the 1500s, but really came into prominence in the 1700s. So in 1742, they started to take advantage of the fast flowing River Douglas, which goes through Wigan. And that really gave birth to the coal mining industry as, as they know it here, like with these statues here that made it famous because coal was easily transportable all around the country. But then came the canals in 1774, only about 30 years later, and that really changed everything as well. The Leeds, Liverpool canals, which gave such prominence to so many industries being shipped all around the country, and that really took over. Cotton as well, I should mention, the cotton industry here was massive as well. So you had coal and cotton. So the trains came here in the 1830s, and it was one of the first places, Wigan, where the trains came because they knew the importance of, we need to ship this stuff all around. So let's get the trains there. And then the last mine here closed in 1992, and the last cotton mill closed in 1980. So it's really interesting to come here and see what is left of Wigan after those two dominant industries disappeared. Yeah, so this was, Debenhams. So I'm guessing this closed probably not too long ago. And I wonder what it is now. It looks like a new arcade. Let's see if we can get in there in a second, but look at these. So much interesting stuff. The Maypole colliery disaster in Abram killing 75 miners. Jeez, George Orwell first published The Road to Wigan Pier. HMV now open. Ooh, that's interesting. Lots of history on the walls though, lots of history on show. This is really good. In these towns that need to celebrate the industry, it's doing a really good job, Wigan. That's ace. So far, just the one shop that's shut down there. Look, HMV. For some reason, I thought that all HMV had gone bust. Well, that's not the case. The London store had to close, but recently it's announced that they're opening again. They're being able to open again. So that's good seeing HMV back. In London, that is, and good to see one here as well. Another empty one there, but overall in here, fine. I think there's like two, and it feels really, really busy. So that's good. Familiar sight in most towns at the moment, an empty Wilco. Store is now closed, all 400 were shut recently. Look at that inside. You can just see nothing in there. 
another set of amusements just there as well. There is a lot of that in the town centre, but overall, the town centre is looking a lot better than a lot of the ones I go to. I always jinx it, I say it's doing well, and then immediately I come across a load. One there. Good to see Warhammer doing well though. Looks like some old music store here gone. Spatial. Yeah, so my couple of granddads worked in the pits uh, all their lives, you know, from, from school right through to, to retirement. Yeah. Uh, just remember them sort of walking, uh, tales of them walking to and from the pit yeah. uh, before shifts, and that's cool, quite, quite, a, quite a long walk. Yeah. And one oh. of my granddads had uh, silicosis, uh, which is like an infection of the, uh, of the lungs and chest. And I, I just remember when I was a child being, he had periodic sort of uh, coughing fits and things like yeah. that. And that was all caused by, by, by the pit. But he did still live till he was 90. Yeah, uh, wow. yeah. how, how old do you reckon they'd have been when they first went down the pits then? Quite young, I would think. 13, 14, I, wow. I would think. I, I would think something like that. I'm not entirely sure, but he was certainly young. Yeah, yeah. so we, Wigan Pier's down there, and th there is a mill around there as well. But the pier itself, big, big, a lot of people don't realise this, but it's actually just a, lo lo um, a landing area for the ba where they fill the barges up the coal. Right. So shed that you can go over. People assume it's like a like, holiday Wigan Pier. Like Blackpool Pier, yeah. It's yeah. a pier for loading coal onto the barges oh, up wow. on the the Liverpool Canal. Yeah. So that's yeah. just down that, there? That's just down there, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. Yeah. Cool, all right, yeah. nice one. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. Thank Good you so much, mate. Cheers. So I just stopped to ask that fella there if he knew of any mill chimneys, and he said, well, yeah, look in the distance. One right down there. So I'm just heading towards the chimney now. I can see it in the distance. Often when I see them, I think, oh, I'll be there in a minute. And then you realize actually they're quite far away. But we've got to go check it out, the first one anyway. Apparently there might be another one as well. That's another thing that me and Orwell have in common. We like chimneys this the old mill it's attached to all broken wow so there it is in the distance behind me i think this is as close as we can get to it it's pretty blocked off it looks super dangerous on the inside but you can see this here this would have been part of the old mill the old mill walls yeah maybe orwell didn't like them like i do but this is how he describes them in the book he had an appreciation he said about wigan once I halted in the street and counted the factory chimneys I could see. There were 33 of them, but there would have been far more if the air had not been obscured by smoke. A belching chimney is repulsive, chiefly because it implies warped lives and ailing children. Look at it from a purely aesthetic standpoint, and it might have a certain macabre appeal. I find that anything outrageously strange generally ends by fascinating me, even when I abominate it. Amazing. But yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Having the two viewpoints of the chimneys from two different times. Orwell, when he was looking at them, they were, as he describes, belching out smoke and literally fueling the industries that grew these places, these towns, these cities, wherever they were. And then my time point, looking at them now, merely as a memory, a memory of what once was, of what work once was, of what industry once was, and now, all gone, all going, they're disappearing so fast. Let's go check out the market, see what this is like. This is the only market I've ever been to where they're selling sofas. Look at that. That's mad. So on the other side, just out the other end of the market, fair bit closed down here. I think that's actually open, just looks closed down. Couple there, uh, closed down. So yeah, the market, they're actually moving. It says, so I think they're moving a lot of the units and it's probably the wrong time. Maybe, well, it's two o'clock on Tuesday. I don't know, it just didn't seem that busy in there, but I think at times it probably will be. And wherever it moves to, I'm sure that still gets it. Another one there, closed. Yeah, so like that guy was telling me earlier, he said, it's not actually a pier, Wigan Pier, like a pier in Blackpool or something like that. When Orwell came, I think he thought he'd find something like that. That's not what it was. Something to do with it here though. The terminal building built 1777. And I think this is what it was, Wigan Pier. So down there, just there, they'd have loaded up all the boats with coal and anything else they were transporting. So yeah, the horse-drawn barges carry everything from coal, cotton, stone and salt. 
Wow, I've been really happy that I've come across so much of the history here. Another thing as well that me and Orwell have in common, I'm really uh, bigging up the comparisons between me and him here, but this one bit that I came across in the book, yeah, I found it. And if you've watched any of my other videos, you'll see the similarities between what he's saying. Towns like Sheffield, Leeds have scores of thousands of back-to-back -back houses which are all condemned type but will remain standing for decades. I have inspected great numbers of houses in various mining towns and villages and made notes on their points. Now I've been all over in my videos exploring old mining towns and I have seen the back-to-back -back houses and he, he describes them as the two up two downs, these tiny things which were literally just built for the mines but yet he was speaking it again back when they were actually lived in for the mining purposes and I've explored them in my videos. As you walk through the industrial towns you lose yourself in labyrinths of little brick houses blackened by smoke festering in planless chaos round miry alleys and little cindy yards where there are stinking dustbins and half ruinous water closets. But yeah again we've got the two sets of eyes from different times but looking at the same thing. Ah it's ace look at that one there and this place is just oh it feels like there's so where well, you can feel the history all around and look at this I saw this just then check this out your men's dining hall Look at that, that's where you'd be getting your lunch after a hard shift or during a hard shift. Bit of old staircase there. That's mad, isn't it? Wow. Oh, I might have to get, I'm gonna have to get the drone out, have a little fly around that chimney, man, I love it. For in the industrial areas, one always feels that the smoke and filth must go on forever and that no part of the Earth's surface can escape it. Slag heaps and chimneys seem a more normal, probable landscape than grass and trees. One scene especially lingers in my mind. An interminable vista of factory chimneys, chimney beyond chimney, fading away into a dim, blackish haze. What's Wigan like to live in? Do you like it? Um, superb, but um, there's a lot of tents on the streets. The football team's great. Um, it's just like a lot of drugs and alcohol. We've got a hell of a lot of drugs in there. Oh, really? If you five miles a day, you can buy heroin and you can't go gain. Really? Yeah. Is there a lot of unemployment in the town as yes, well then? Yes, yeah, really? Because yeah. Yeah, I was thinking like the video is kind of like about what happened when all the mills disappeared. Yeah. So yeah, it's yeah, kind of... I've been down there. Yeah, it was yeah, cool. Yeah, I flew my yeah, drone yeah, down yeah, the yeah, chimney. Yeah, yeah. It was pretty mad. Excellent. We're, but, we're um, the best team in the world. We're are the they? We've got the best farms in the world. Oh, mate, that's good to hear. So that was really interesting then. The town centre, I mean, I've seen way, way worse town centres and this one was really, really busy. It looked great to see it like that. There was obviously a, a lot of vacant properties and some boarded up properties and there was that big redevelopment area that would be interesting to revisit as well. And I got chatting to that guy then who, who was called Barry and he said there is a lot of crime in the area. There's a lot of drugs, there's things like that. And now walking around today, it, it didn't feel like that at all, but obviously a lot of places have an underbelly that goes on everywhere. So the second part of this video has brought me to the National Coal Mining Museum. Now this isn't in Wigan, this is in Wakefield. But like George Orwell when he came up north, he travelled all around the different areas that were famous for coal mining. So I thought I'd come here today. The best part of the road to Wigan Pier is the descriptions of when George Orwell went down a still working mine and talks about the conditions down there. We'll walk around, we'll learn all about this stuff, I'm super excited. And again, we'll be joined by the words of Orwell from 1936, from what he saw. So let's go do it. So the chapters in the book where Orwell speaks about the world's reliance on coal back in 1936. I'm just going to read a little bit, but it, it, remi it reminds me of today as well, because as much as we like to imagine we're a, a progressive world moving forward and we don't use coal anymore, we still do. We use so much coal. So these areas like this, where they used to go into the centre of the earth to get coal, this is still happening, just not in England, just not in the United Kingdom. But yeah, I'll read this. Our civilization is founded on coal, more completely than one realises until one stops to think about it. The machines that keep us alive and the machines that make the machines are all directly or indirectly dependent on coal. In the metabolism of the Western world, the coal miner is second in importance only to the man who ploughs the soil. For this reason, the actual process by which coal is extracted is well worth watching. 
if you get the chance and are willing to take the trouble. Now, he actually went down when the mines were still working and he saw the people doing it. Obviously today the mines closed down. I can't remember when this mine actually closed. I'm sure we'll find out. And here we've got the percentage of the coal cut mechanically. So in 1900, it was only 1.5% cut mechanically. When Orwell went down in the 1930s, it was 31% cut mechanically. And then by the 1950s, 79%. Look at this, the old stables where they keep the horses. So this is where people would have queued up to get paid at the end of the day. Mistakes in wages will not be rectified unless reported before leaving pay office. I just want to read this bit in the book about how many people died and how many accidents there were. The rate of accidents amongst miners is so high compared with that in other trades that casualties are taken for granted almost as they would be in a minor war. And that is really interesting to read about because my family history, all of my dad's side were miners going back generation after generation. And I think it's either my great great grandfather or my great 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 grandfather died in a mining accident when he was really young. So I'm hopefully going to go visit the grave at the end of this video where he's buried up in County Durham because I've never been up there and I'd like to learn more about what happened. So George Orwell was about six foot four when he went and visited the working mines. Now obviously the mines are really, really small and one thing he speaks about is how far you had to travel, not just straight into the ground going down, but once you get down there, you imagine you just start working straight away. You get out of the shaft down, then you start working. But that wasn't the case at all. What is surprising is the immense horizontal distances that have to be traveled underground. I had not realized that before he gets to work, he may have to creep through passages as long as from London Bridge to Oxford Circus. Three miles is fairly normal. When you think of a coal mine, you think of depth, heat, darkness, blackened figures hacking at walls of coal. You don't think necessarily of those miles of creeping to and fro. Look at this here, the shower room. So yeah, imagine that, a shower after being in the mine all day long. You're completely black from the coal, it'd be what you needed. But yeah, pit head baths will have been a luxury. Not all of the mines will have had them, especially back when Orwell was going down. And he says this, as soon as the miner comes above the ground, he gargles a little water to get the cold dust out of his throat and then goes home and neither washes or does not, according to his temperament. So the National Coal Mining Museum was amazing. Now I really wanted to film, because you can go on tours in the actual old mine. You go about 150 meters down. Now I, I did go down it, but because it's still a gassy mine, I wasn't allowed to film down there. You're not allowed to take electronic stuff. But I do recommend doing it. It was absolutely amazing to see the history of, of mining throughout the ages. You go down and then you walk for an hour under there. But the final part of this video has brought me to Durham, County Durham, to a church, and in particular a graveyard in County Durham, where my great, great, great granddad is buried somewhere here. So we're going to try and find his grave because he was a miner that died in a mining accident when he was just in his 30s. Just going to read this bit here from the book. It says this. The great mining disasters which happen from time to time in which several hundred men are killed are usually caused by explosions. Hence one tends to think of explosions as the chief danger of mining. Actually, the great majority of accidents are due to normal everyday dangers of the pit, in particular the falls of roof. Now that's how my great 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 granddad died in a mine, part of the roof fell on him. So let's go find it, let's just show you how many graves there are. Big graveyard. Right, well we better wander around this graveyard and see if we can find the name Burnip. Oh, there it is. Stephen Burnip. We found it. Wow. There we go, we've made it. There's the grave of my great, great, great granddad, the miner, Stephen Burnip. All right, there we go. It says, loving memory of Stephen Burnip, beloved husband of Elizabeth Burnip, who was accidentally killed in the Hunter Pit Medamsley, age 33 and a half years. Oh, and also their son Robert died in, oh, he was only eight and a half months old is the son. So yeah, he was 33 and a half when he died in the, the mining accident down there. Now I'm 31. 
So he was only two years older than I am now, and what a shift in the world. He was down into the earth with a pickaxe hacking at the mines, and I walk around with a camera on a selfie stick talking about mines. Also, I don't know if you can tell, but all the other graves around it, this one, I don't know if it's picking up the detail on the camera, but it is a really ornate, nice grave. Now, Stephen Burnip and his family back at the end of the 1800s and the start of the 1900s won't have had any money. They'll have been really, really poor. So the fact that they've got a really nice grave is strange, but there's a bit in the book that I think might explain it. Let me find it. When a miner is killed at work, it is usual for the other miners to make up a subscription, generally of a shilling each for his widow. So I imagine that maybe the nice grave came from all the other miners chipping together over their lost friend who died when a piece of the roof fell, fell on him. So online I did a bit of research and it says here, yeah, fatally crushed by a fall of stone when taking down some stone for the purpose of making more height. Oh wow, you can just imagine how, well I mean, how scary it would be anyway just being down there, but I mean, you can't even imagine it, can you? Now in some cultures it's uh, traditional to leave a coin on a grave when you visit and pay respect. Now, I was actually looking at a coin collection yesterday for a totally different reason. However, I came across a penny from 1870, the 1870s, which was the decade Stephen Burnip, the great, great, my great, great, great granddad was born. So this penny is from 1872, just a couple of years after Stephen Burnett was born. And I just thought it was interesting because this penny is something and probably one of the only things that I could find or even think of that existed in Stephen Burnett's world and still exists in mine and I just had it in my house. So I thought that was a, a thing that I could bring today. Just pop on there for you. There we go. The grave of my great, great, great granddad, a miner. Where I come from, literally where I come from there. It's so interesting to finally come and visit. He made the wandering turnip. Years down the line, well, that's where the wandering turnip comes from. I bet as well, the majority of these graves will be from miners or miners' families, as you can imagine. So where I am stood now, I thought it was a good place to end this video because this here was the last place that coal was mined in England. And it was at the Bradley Coal Mine. It was an open cast mine and it shut down finally in 2020. So not long ago at all. But this is literally about half a mile from where my, my great, great, great granddad's buried. So I thought this was a good place to finish this video. Now we started in Wigan and that was super interesting just looking at the high street and a lot of it was just worn down to be fair. The people were amazing, so, so lovely. But this video was always gonna be more than just a death of the high street. It was gonna be me retracing the steps of Orwell and looking into the mining history and seeing what he found back in 1936 and looking into my history of it as well. And I'm gonna finish with just one last passage from the book, one last bit that I found really, really powerful. And he's directly talking about coal mining here. And like I said before though, the world, as much as we try to say we don't, or we're trying to find other sources of fuel, in 2023, we still rely on coal so, so much. It really does still make the world turn. But alongside coal, we also mine things now like lithium. Now lithium, lithium is the mineral that is used to make iPhones, laptops, vapes, electric cars, anything that needs a battery really is from lithium. Now the mines where that is found, the conditions, I've looked into it before and it's awful, people being exploited, cheap, dangerous labor, like what I've been looking at today, it's so dangerous there. So when I read this passage, though he's speaking about coal, I think it's so relevant to the world today and how we function and what we choose to ignore that actually keeps us going. So I'll finish with this. Down there where the coal is dug, it is a sort of world apart which one can quite easily go through life without ever hearing about. Yet it is the absolute necessary counterpart of our world above. Practically everything we do, from eating an ice cream to crossing the Atlantic, from baking a loaf of bread to writing a novel, involves the use of coal directly or indirectly. For all the arts of peace, coal is needed. If war breaks out, it is needed all the more. 
in time of revolution, the miner must go on working or the revolution must stop, for revolution, as much as reaction, needs coal. Whatever may be happening on the surface, the hacking and the shoveling have got to continue without pause, or at any rate, without pausing for more than a few weeks at a time, in order that Hitler may march the goose step, that the Pope may denounce Bolshevism, that the cricket crowds may assemble at Lords, coal has got to be forthcoming. It is only very rarely when I make a definite mental effort that I connect this coal with that far off labour in the mines. All of us really owe the comparative decency of our lives to the poor drudges underground, blackened to the eyes with their throats full of coal dust, driving their shovels forward with arms and belly muscles of steel.